Okay, Jane. Yeah. Go ahead, Jane. Hello to everyone and welcome to the Architectural Practice Communities. Uh, great designs for even better causes. The SAME Design Awards Program. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us on a Wednesday afternoon in October. We have a great present set of presentations for you. We have the three top winners from the 2020 Design Awards program. They're going to be presenting their projects and talking with you about what they did. And then we will say a few words after about the SAME Design Awards program itself. Um, the Design Awards program will be offering, this program today will be offering AIA credits as well as a credits for the American Planning um, Association brought to you by the firm Urban Collaborative. So our presenters today are Matt Klusnick from QPK Design in New York. His project is Thayer Hall at West Point. We also have with us JJ Tang from HDR and their project is Wilford Hall at Lackland um, Air Force Base in San Antonio. I'm sure it's part of the San Antonio group of bases. And finally, we have from Urban Collaborative, Zoe Anton and Holly Workman. They're presenting um, the national, um, their work for Monterey. Um, it's mostly well known as the Naval Postgraduate School and it's the Naval Support Activity at Monterey. So can I have the next slide, please? Thank you, fabulous. Um, for those that are connecting through VPN, please read these house notes. Um, the audio broadcast will be available afterwards as well as the slides that you're seeing. To get us started, we have a short poll. Would you please click on there who you represent, whether it is active duty, civilian with government, academic institution, small business, et cetera, so we better know who's listening. Um, we are very interested in having you participate in the Design Awards program, and we're so glad that so many of you joined us. So a few words about this um, SAME Design Awards program. Our initial program was in 2020. It, the program was set up to recognize and celebrate outstanding facilities to identify facilities that improve the operational efficiency, enhance mission accomplishment, and provide a positive impact for their federal agency, as well as buildings that help produce a low life cycle cost and encourage sustainability and energy efficient designs. And obviously we want for everyone, we want for the program to improve the quality of design everywhere. So we will start out with our first presenter which is JJ Tang from HDR, presenting Wilford Hall at Lackland. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Um, I'm JJ Tang from HDR, the Director of Federal Facilities for HDR. So uh, I'm here to present a design concept uh, to you all uh, of Wilford Hall, which is located at Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio. The designer of record is HDR. Um, so the concept, so what's the concept of this design? As you know, by looking at a title, you know, it's, it's in Texas, it's a regional, and then, uh, it's for the Air Force. It's about navigation. And then the third one, it's medical. So it's the advanced military medical. So that's the design concept is really trying to, you know, center only three elements. Um, so. I want to talk about for a minute a quote from uh, uh, Ken Frankton about the critical regionalism, which I call the modern regionalism, which is really centered on not just the universal progression of quality of modern architecture. It's not international style, but it's really also value the response, particular con to the context. In this case, in Texas, you know, focus its own topographic, climate, light, tectonic form, 
So that's really the bottom line of what means to be a modern regionalism. Um, this, by looking at this photo, the Finnish photo of the project, it can tell it's very modern, yet that is a flavor of Southern Central Texas type of architecture. So it's not like if you move this building to a New York as example, you, you can feel that's not in the right location. Um, so I wanna address the critical regionalism, the design approach to this. This is not a shot of the of the building, um, you know, different materials, um, very regional and also uh, modern, very modern looking. Um, it's a uh, it's very site specific. So let's first look at the base standards for for us, for those of us who do work day in and day out for DOD, as you know, <laughs> you know, every base has a standards. It's in this particular case, a Lackland is the beige, the brown, the bronze. Um, it's uh, it's about that. And the image you see, it's a standard architecture at that particular base. You know, um, uh, I, I don't, I used the war, I don't, you know, how to interpret. It's just, uh, uh, you know, day in and day out, the architecture you see. Um, so to keep that in mind and, and you know, the decision for any architect is what I'm going to do with that, that uh, am I going to simply um, be part of that group or is that something we can do better uh, still, you know, within the fall within the standard. So let's look at the building forms. So you see the, the arrows, you know, from the upper left hand and then uh, counterclockwise of the formation, building formations. You get a big program, you know, you, you figure it out is whatever 100,000 square foot, in this case, you know, uh, 600,000 square foot, and then you divide it into a separate buildings. Uh, so it's more manageable. And then thinner buildings increase light exposure, obviously. And then you all, uh, oriented the elements of these four elements for maximum solar benefit, you know, and purposely oriented uh, per the location of that particular uh, component. And the next decision is, okay, what's your circulation, you know, plug and play. In this case, we insert a concourse. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Why is the concourse as the circulation spine as a building organizer, um, after that, you can see the towards the uh, lower left hand corner is uh, facing, you know, it's very typical for DOD um, milcom projects, uh, phase funded, you know, you get phase one, phase two and phase three in this case to be able to complete a project in, uh, uh, in phase funded projects. Um, you get a design in such a way it's easy to, to be able to accomplish the phase component. In this case, you can see the, 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 the dark uh, bronze color representing phase one and the phase two is, is in the center plus the concourse and phase three is the, the last piece and plus the support area. <coughs> Excuse me. Wayfinding and circulation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you see these four building elements are four fingers. Um, we purposely place the circulation in such a way the public access on one side and the private access is another side. I'm gonna turn my camera off for a minute. <coughs> now talking about formation and navigations. Um, formation, you know, you see the Air Force fighter jets that we interpret that as a formation which is perfect fit for this clinic uh, components. You get four clinic components representing the formation of the, of the Air Force fighter jets. Navigation in this case is the concourse. You know, it's the airport concourse concept regarding how you navigate, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in, in this lab, in this very large complex. So you can see uh, that's the, towards the right hand side translate into the clinic side of the circulation and the concourse side of the public circulation. That's the image of the constructed uh, building. And this is a 
large photo of the concourse, the circulation spine, three story high, you know, remind you uh, a concourse you see in the airport. And this is uh, interior of private circulation of the clinic, you know, improving patient privacy, facilitate care conditions and reduce noise stress. Uh, now let's look at the material applications. So first we'll look at the stone. You know, it's a very local material. As you can see towards the upper right hand side is the, is the uh, constructed photo, constructed uh, building, uh, depict the, the stone. And then towards the right hand side is the 3D image of the section of, of the building section depict the stone. And then towards the right hand side, uh, lower left hand side is what shows where the stone has been applied to the building. In this, in this case, you see the red uh, texture is where the stone has been um, applied mainly towards the admin function of the building. Uh, saying, uh, you know, arrangement, look at uh, anodized uh, a bronze and bridge soleil really representing the bulk of the clinic, the four clinic fingers. Um, it's made of uh, bronze and, uh, and then with sun shades. Great soleil and entrance to define the concourse entrance. The zinc, it's a dark colored zinc. It's really representing the back of the house functions the entrance, I get that three views to enter the concourse, almost like the, the airport entrance. You know, one, you can see one is towards the lower left hand side, two is in the upper and three and four, it's in the middle and the lower right hand side to, um, to illustrate the entrance to the building. And this is not a close shot of the entrance for, from the south. And the compensation of materials, uh, you know, once again representing the regional architecture and in the more modern setting. It's very, you know, very clean and straightforward. Let's look at the orientations. You know, the building, as we all know, the building uh, the best oriented towards the south and north, so you have better um, technique to control the sound in 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 southern Texas. So, um, you know, the building, the four fingers is, you know, this is south and this is north. And then the con concourse is in the front. It's over here. Uh, this is the study of the sun shade control, summer solace, equinox and winter solstice to see how the, the white sun shades works in this particular application and solo control of the concourse entrance. Sustainability, you know, photovoltaic and low air bottle roof and rainwater collection. You can see the rainwater collection and sun shades um, in this photo towards the right hand, lower right hand side. Last one is the gardens and plaza locations. We have developed uh, the uh, number of gardens to um, uh, to encourage, you know, the evidence-based design or organized into the dining gardens, sculptural gardens, roof terrace, and therapeutic gardens. And then uh, in the front of the building is the Nagasi Plaza, which is the historic old oak trees uh, used to be in front of the uh, old um, Woofer Hall. Once the Woofer Hall get demolished, then we are able to save this and turn this into an entrance uh, legacy plaza. So this is what I mentioned, you know, that's the, the historic uh, oak tree. And this is old Woofer Hall once that um, is demolished. And then we uh, use this, um, emphasize and use this, pay homage to uh, the historic uh, base. And this is the look of the main entrance, Negacy and Access Plaza over here. The, the old Woofer Hall would be opposite side of of the, the building you see right now. Some uh, photos of the garden, the sculpture garden, the appearance garden, 
and the rooftop uh, terrace. This is a rooftop terrace with nature. I think that concludes my portion of the presentation of the Woofer Hall Ambulatory Surgical Center at Lackland Air Force Base. I'm going to turn over to, um, to Zoe uh, for the next project presentation. Thank you so much and good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you for everyone for attending this presentation today. I am so excited to speak with you about the Naval Support Activity Monterey's installation development plan. Uh, today, we're gonna jump right into it and start with some introductions and uh, get to what made this project successful through wide stakeholder engagement, a complete campus design, and really affect a path towards effective growth while still preserving the valuable history of Naval Support Activity Monterey. So that in the end, we were really creating or making these great places. So first off, um, I'm Holly Workman. I'm a planner and project manager uh, with the Urban Collaborative, where I have worked doing master planning for federal entities for about the past 10 years. And I also wanted to take a moment uh, to introduce two individuals who aren't with us today, but were really instrumental uh, in the success of the project. Uh, Garth Nagel, uh, Nagel, he's a senior facility planner and project manager with NAFAC Southwest and also Commander James. Um, he's the Public work, uh, Works Officer for Naval Support Activity Monterey. And I'm Zoe Antone. I'm a Planner and Project Manager for the Urban Collaborative. And this um, is a project that Holly and I worked a lot on together. Um, and we, yeah, we're excited to present to you today. And so just for a little background, uh, the, the installation development plan or IDP started in 2017 and was really about a year and a half long uh, process or effort to create this logical and effective long range development uh, plan and management plan. Uh, uh, Naval Sport Activity Monterey or NSAM, it's home to the Naval Postgraduate School and it includes two historic uh, districts full of natural and cultural resources. And so our focus was on the main campus. For this effort, we had tremendous stakeholder engagement. We conducted an online survey via SurveyMonkey to try and understand NSAM's uh, users' opinions. And in approximately two months, we had over 160 responses from administration, students, uh, NPS or Naval Postgraduate School faculty, as well as NSAM support staff. Um, this was successful in part because we were able to work with the school to post uh, the survey um, and, meet, and also major planning events on the school media's home, home webpage. We asked a series of about 25 questions about how students and faculty arrived to the campus, what gate they use, kind of the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to the campus, uh, among others. Uh, we also interviewed, uh, we spent a week um, interviewing over 60 people on site and NSAM. We had two planning groups uh, conducting one hour interviews over the course of the week to really try and uh, better understand kind of the current and future conditions. Uh, we asked stakeholders to describe their mission, kind of current location, their configuration of the assigned space, either functional relationships, and improvements to the facilities and infrastructure. We also had two on-site workshops where participants collaborative, collaboratively uh, helped to conduct site analysis, develop courses of, of action, um, analyze, evaluate, and rate those courses of action in order to select a preferred alternative that we then continued to refine, uh, which became the long-term plan. Uh, leadership and stakeholders also collaboratively developed a planning vision statement uh, that defined the goals and objectives to really guide development of the master plan. 
Uh, we then laid out a plan for a secure campus with connected quads and pathways, adaptable spaces, uh, and integrated uh, historic and natural landscapes. And I will walk you through that plan. I want to first kind of start with existing conditions so you can understand where um, things were today and kind of where we took it. Um, the existing campus, it's approximately 134 acres and the academic functions occur on the west side. I wish I could, could draw, um, but it's on the west side of the campus. You can see a campus quad or green on the west side. Uh, the east side is kind of more in light and in, uh, industrial functions, but I really want to point out here is that there's a lot of um, existing kind of small disjointed parking lots. Um, so that's something that we really try to, to look towards in the long term plan. Um, and you can also see the main gate that's also on the west side, um, and that creates uh, backups and traffic at the current location. So that's also something that we really wanted to address. So that the, the long term plan really focused on creating consolidated parking at the perimeter so that we can open up the main campus center to pedestrians and green space. Uh, we created two new campus uh, quad connections near the library. That's building, if you can see it, uh, 339. That's up in the northwest uh, corner of the campus. And it really connects the campus uh, east-west and also kind of north-south, if you can see that. Um, small, some small cottages were demolished to make way for one consolidated uh, administration and academic building, uh, which we called Monterey Hall, uh, and that flanks the other edge of the quad. Uh, there's also a proposal. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, there's also a proposal for a roundabout uh, and a new gate on the east side. Uh, which includes a vis visitor center to kind of alleviate congestion and, and traffic on that west side. Uh, so this next uh, slide, I think, really shows the perimeter parking and consolidated parking lots. You can see that in, in orange on this plan. And the plan also proposed uh, two new pedestrian gates on uh, the north, the north edge along along Del Monte Avenue, uh, near existing bus stops. And this was really crucial to really help facilitate and encourage public transit. Because at the moment, if you were to take the bus, you'd got, kind of have to walk all the way around uh, to the main gate on the west side, which is not so convenient for users. Uh, the plan also enhanced sidewalk connections. You can see here existing sidewalks are in kind of a light blue and proposed are in green, so a lot more sidewalk connections. It was key that these sidewalks connected, of course, to the new pedestrian turnstiles uh, at the along the perimeter, along the fence line, uh, as well as each building on the campus. And since the campus doesn't live in a bubble, we also reviewed the city of Monterey's master plans and thought about the connections to public transit and the adjacent neighborhoods um, and public transit all also to downtown, which is actually just about five to 10 minutes um, west of the site. Um, and of course, those new pedestrian gates. And so for NSAM, creating a great place and a great plan was uh, to create a secure, walkable campus, a complete campus um, created with and from uh, wide stakeholder engagement, which will really help foster the longevity of the plan. And in fact, this is a rendering showing that conversion of a parking lot near the library that I mentioned. Um, it's, it's converting a parking lot to this campus quad and outdoor dining uh, adjacent to the library. Uh, this conversion actually is currently underway. It was one of the first uh, projects to be executed from the installation development plan. And you can see in the background of this rendering, uh, Monterey Hall, which is that new consolidated academic building. Um, and the one new building to accommodate growth um, in which I'll turn it over to Zoe to discuss further. Great. 
So the third element that we wanted to talk about um, this project was how to achieve effective growth while preserving that history on this campus. The building that you're looking at is uh, Hotel Del Monte, which was built in the 1920s. Um, of course, today they call it Herman Hall. And this building was part, originally part of a resort that's now this uh, postgraduate campus. It's part of uh, one of the two distinct historic districts on campus. And um, this is kind of, we wanted to illustrate how the campus needs are gonna be accommodated uh, as, as the education changes and the campus grows with new technologies um, and other educational elements that are needed while respecting this historic form that's really beautiful. So considering the out exterior uh, built form, we also need to face the challenges that lay inside. Um, here you can see outdated classrooms that don't meet 21st century needs. There's outdated lab spaces um, that, are, that aren't flexible enough to fit modern equipment or the needs of the students and professors and some that really aren't being used as labs at all anymore. Um, this one was more of a storage place. And of course, uh, while the offices there hold a lot of history, um, they're no longer conducive to the current collaborative learning environments um, that are part of our, our academics now. In order to properly renovate these buildings, keeping that exterior, but really looking at the interior, um, needing a full gutting of source, um, we created an initial renovation plan. Uh, this conceptual plan helps to determine how to renovate the facilities while also minimizing moves for all the building occupants. To do that, uh, we had to complete comprehensive walkthroughs of all the buildings to really understand the users, um, occupant numbers, so both students and professors and the times they would be using those buildings. Uh, we interviewed lots of stakeholders, as Holly mentioned, to really understand the requirements, um, the current needs, and, and as well as potential future needs. You know, there's a lot of labs and what will be the academic uh, pedagogy in the future. The outcome or of the adopted installation development plan really led to the development of a campus modernization plan. And this took everything to a much more detailed level. Um, the study looked at five of the primary academic buildings within one of the historic districts. Um, it was around that kind of long quad that you saw at the southwest corner of the campus. We did a lot of looking at precedent images and also wanted to meet the vision that was collaboratively created by students and professors um, where they wanted modern buildings uh, that were adaptable and safe and transparent. And, you know, this was a real challenge while keeping that exterior form of the of the historic buildings. But we were able to bring the spaces into the 21st century learning environment while still preserving that the buildings and the quads. Um, we brought in natural light, made things a lot more transparent, uh, looked at making adaptable and flexible spaces really to achieve that vision. We worked on conceptual floor plans with the goal of creating really flexible spaces and a coherent flow through the buildings. Uh, this is the first floor of Halligan Hall, which is mostly um, very high-tech laboratories um, that don't need a lot of light, but need to be very flexible spaces. And then the second floor of the same hall is mostly offices and classrooms. And we focused here on bringing in that natural light using atrium spaces and creating office suites uh, with collaborative spaces in them because uh, professors and students at the Naval Postgraduate School often meet in small groups and there's a lot of learning done in those small group environments. So with those five buildings, um, we created a detailed and phased implementation plan that included designing, building, and as well as moving um, people and equipment. There's some really specialized equipment being used. 
So that's a really important piece. Uh, it's not just design, right? You have to figure out the system and, and how it will be implemented. And we got great results. So um, with that renovation plan and the modernization plan, we were able to create a place that accommodated growth, um, but balanced it with the history of the campus and really making the Naval Postgraduate School campus and its buildings uh, more resilient and healthier for the people that are using them. All right, that ends our presentation and I, I think we'll be handing off to the next presenter and we'll probably do questions at the end. So Matt Klusnik is our next presenter with Fair Hall. Oh, thank you, good afternoon everybody. and. Uh, Thank you for attending and uh, very pleased with the presentations ahead of us, very exciting projects and uh, thank you for sharing them. I'm here to talk about Thayer Hall. Um, this renovation of Thayer Hall is actually the second reimagination of this original facility. The work of this project included the planning design, including field investigations, design analysis, narratives, academic programming, uh, and construction cost estimates for the full renovation of Thayer Hall. The design also included the concept design options for replacement of the 1950s structure uh, with a vertical expansion of two floors anticipated to accommodate the expanded academic space and program needs of the military academy. The goal of this project also was the development of a complete renovation plan, including installation status report, condition update, validation, phasing options, project implementation, and customer phasing coordination. Issues of energy efficiency, structural integrity with respect to progressive collapse, seismic events, security and life safety were also addressed. The comprehensive field investigation data and analysis was used as a baseline for the development of this renovation plan to, building, build, to bring this facility into line with flexible space utilization, addressing the standards to support the unique academic mission of the United States Military Academy including the improvement of operational efficiency, accommodation of collaborative space, introduction of daylighting, as well as other programmatic needs, enhancing and positively reinforcing the West Point brand. So to put things in perspective, here's the West Point site to kind of fit you into to where the building's located in West Point. It's located on the east side of Cullum Road, um, on the west shore, shore of the Hudson River, and it's within the secure perimeter of the United States Military Academy. Thayer's length is orientated north and south, and it sits above the Hudson River. There's steep slopes to the east uh, above their boating center and river quartz fields. Um, and to the left is the central core or the central area of the US Military Academy. To understand this design, I think it's important to touch base on history. This is a photograph, approximately 1910, of the construction of the original building. The original building was built as an indoor riding facility. It was known as a riding hall, and it was designed to replace a, a, smaller, a smaller structure. Uh, back at the turn of the century, horsemanship was an integral part of West Point's uh, rigor uh, back when the cavalry was, uh, was mounted on horseback. Upon the completion of this building in 1911, it was one of the largest indoor riding facilities in the world. The, this original building was also the part of a 193 design competition for new facilities at West Point's Academy. This design competition uh, was won by Cram Goodview and Ferguson, it was a firm located in Washington, I mean, in New York and Boston. There's this successful design of this was also a part of uh, other designs for other buildings on campus, including the barracks, the gymnasium, Hayes Gymnasium, Taylor Hall, and the iconic Cadet Chapel. It's really formed the academic and, uh, and image of collegiate Gothic uh, military architecture for West Point. This photograph was taken in 1914. Um, note the glazed, if, as if you look on the roof carefully, glazed panels. It was a daylit building from above. It had an arched roof. Uh, other than that, it has very little natural light that comes into it. 
in its original form, the building was kind of ahead of its time. It was con constructed of two different types of structures. The perimeter walls were heavy load-bearing masonry, and the roof trusses was a three-pin truss that expands approximately 150 feet uh, across the academy. The scale of this building is large. The riding hall here that you can see is approximately 600 feet long and 150 feet wide. In the 1950s, uh, the Corps of Cadets was expanding. Also, the military was changing. Um, advancements in 20th century technology offered changes in warfare, including the mechanization of the battlefield. And horsemanship and, uh, was no longer a part of the academic rigor at West Point as the Army became mechanized. As mentioned, at this point in time, the cadet uh, the population was expanding, and the building was reinvented uh, into an academic building. The arch trust roof was removed, uh, the structure was removed um, in anticipation for uh, insertion of a new structure. So this is approximately mid-1950s, uh, the new structure being installed inside the perimeter of the existing building, in the existing original walls. And it's a massive facility at that point. It, 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 and, and as today, it, uh, it, it currently houses departments of history, mathematical sciences, behavioral sciences, electrical engineering, computer sciences, uh, the academy's audio and visual and media support. And it's really the largest academic building at West Point today. And atop, when it was reconstructed, it was uh, became a parking deck for over 200 cars. So this is it today, viewing from above the huts and looking toward the central campus. The building today, um, although it's very efficient it's in its design, um, it has a number of challenges that uh, that that will be resolved in the in the reinvention of this building. Um, ATFP issues with parking atop top the building, very little natural light uh, inside the building. As you can see, there's only a handful of windows on one story uh, of the four stories of this building. Egress, um, non-compliant, a structural grid that's very tightly designed to an older program, um, acoustic issues, mechanical issues, and accessibility. So here comes the reimagination of Thayer Hall. The building program here and the selected design concept reinvents this nondescript Thayer into a state-of-the-art academic building, responding to current pedagogy and proven West Point Thayer method of teaching. Design creates a stimulating environment that fosters collaborative learning and social interaction while providing facilities befitting of the world's premier leadership and academic institutions. The exterior of our proposed design is constructed of uh, buff Indiana limestone with limestone trim and banding. And this is reversed from the historic shell of the original building. Um, yet it's consistent in its material and its desired aesthetics. The building massing is bookended with limestone pediments and elements and the facade is articulated per the structural rhythm of the original building with periodic pointed Gothic arched window focal points to signify points of entry and building features. Here is being viewed looking to the south uh, with a new pedestrian entry um, on the north end of the building. And this provides secure and accessible uh, controlled access for non-credentialed non visitors, VIPs, and is limited to prevent pedestrians and small electric service vehicles. A similar plaza is located at the south end of Thayer's fifth floor to provide exterior socialization and collaborative space. Here is a view of the interior. Um, the main architectural feature of this building is a four-story atrium located at the third floor. Um, this provides circulation to the cadets and classrooms. Um, it offers natural light via clear story and skylight, becoming the signature space for, Claire, for Thayer Hall. The current building really is in a racetrack type organization. Each floor is, is identical to the, to the floor above or below with really no 
identifiable architectural features. So the new design creates better wayfinding, brings natural light into the building, and creates built space to, to provide socialization, um, collaboration. The design also harkens back to the original structure of the building, bringing natural light into the building. You can see the snip on the right hand of the side, the right hand side of the screen, the arch trusses with natural light coming in, which is similar to the reinvention of up there. So this is a section cut through the building showing that the upper floor is mechanical mezzanine. The upper three floors are office space, collaborative space. The lower areas are classrooms. As you'll see later on in the plans, uh, transverse circulation going toward the river, we, we opened up new windows facing the river to allow views and natural light and, and give better orientation and create a more dynamic interior space. This is a view from the south looking north. Um, it shows the central roof area, which is oops, excuse me, uh, sheathed in copper, proposed to be sheathed in copper. Below that is the mechanical spaces serving the building. There's a plaza at the south end on the stairs fifth floor to provide exterior socialization and collaborative space. Below is an image uh, back from probably around 1980, showing uh, there very much similar as it exists today and its relationship to the rest of the campus. The existing column road that goes adjacent to the, to the left of that or to the west has raised over history. Um, and it really, as you go by, the size and the scale of, of there is really diminished. Um, but with the new addition on top, it really will give the building a much better sense of place uh, within the West Point campus. Issues with accessibility and exterior stairs and, and maintenance were addressed by creating some, some, some building elements to shield stairs from the weather, provide safer and uh, handicapped accessible entries into the building. As you can see, Thayer is, is a part of the visual landscape of West Point as viewed from the Hudson River and across the river. The materials used kind of blend from the southern elements of the campus, Mahan Hall uh, to, the, to, the, to the right or the, to the north of uh, McKim Mead and White's um, West Point Club building. The areas in the central elements, you can see where some of the new penetrations have been added into the building to bring natural light across from, from longitudinal circulation to provide views and, and and areas of collaboration adjacent to those elements. So here are a few of the elevations um, of the building. Um, rectilinear bay windows uh, equipped with vertical bronze fins um, are on the east and west end to reduce low setting southerly sun and provide visual articulation of these windows. As mentioned before, the structural elements of the existing building are carried up through the new addition, tying the buildings together, yet using materials to identify the existing building and the new architecture. Windows are designed to, with sensitivity to main historic, maintain historic uh, integrity of the original building and also comply with ATFP requirements. So here are some of the floor plans. This is the first through third levels, uh, which house predominantly classroom space. Um, Robinson um, Auditorium is located on the far south end. Uh, multiple size classrooms are, are designed to provide flexibility to support different teaching styles. Um, groups of two or more classrooms are proposed to be equipped with operable lift up partitions to enable flexibility for different teaching activities, scheduling and support the academy's interactive and collaborative pedagogy. The east and west corridors on the first to third floors are terminated on the east side with collaborative gathering spaces um, to allow cadets and instructors to meet informally. New windows openings, as I showed in the previous slide, um, provide natural light with outstanding views to the Hudson and create attractive gathering space. Shared light and view to the exterior to outside awareness. The interior spaces are more transparent than the current facility, allowing sharing views into the unique labs and areas of, 
of teaching and resource resources research. Corridor niches are also added to display research and fields of study to create interest and pique curiosity. The upper floor is the fourth through sixth floor is housed faculty department offers offices and centers of excellence. Uh, a new pedestrian public entry plaza is located on the north end of the fifth floor with access provided via the north vehicular ramp. The new entry provides secure access control for non-credentialed visitors, VIP, limited to pedestrians and small electric vehicles. As a whole, this renovate, renovate, renovated facility will provide 140 classrooms and offices for eight academic departments, two auditoriums, additional study and formal collaboration in laboratory space. So it brings the square footage to approximately 485,000 gross square feet. As a part of the development of this, we went through a elaborate uh, field investigation and studies um, from phasing construction analysis, even for crane access. Access around West Point is tight uh, due to its location in the steep hillside, as well as limited uh, pedestrian and vehicle vehicular access. We started off with a phase design and through value engineering and analysis, uh, we're able to consolidate this into one, one design period. One design uh, period. We did quite an uh, extensive ATFP analysis, including blast analysis, to understand what the repercussions of blasts were in different areas of the building, including the side as well as the roof deck, um, so that when we create a new building, uh, we'll create a building that's resilient to those threats. The structure of the new building will be replaced similar to what was done in the 1950s, removing it, remaining the existing shell, and building a new structure within that will be compliant with spatial organizations designed to fit today's classrooms and flexibility um, and create a building that's uh, more resilient to progressive collapse uh, and other seismic events. The idea of this was to create a facility that uh, can draw the best cadets and maintain the best um, instructors and professors so they can compete with peer institutions um, around the country. Project also culminated in uh, project definition reports, DD 1391s. Uh, it's challenging with, uh, thing with this project is that it was a combination of SRM and DD and, and MILCON dollars to be built simultaneously. So uh, the, the West Point uh, working with Congress is, looks like they will be able to achieve that. And again, this is an unbuilt project and construction is scheduled to start in fiscal year 2027. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And thanks to everyone that presented. Um, we really enjoyed looking at your projects. Uh, do we have questions? I got a beautiful elevation from Zoe and people talking about the historic background being interesting. Do we have questions from all of those online? We had a few questions in the Q&A that uh, Holly and I responded to. Oh, please, um, Lennis, could you briefly comment on those? Sure, one of the questions was how ve vehicular traffic was separated from pedestrians, uh, specifically thinking of, of service vehicles. And I had responded and mentioned that there's actually a perimeter road on, on the outside of the campus um, with uh, alleys to access loading docks and, and service areas, um, therefore keeping the, the center campus kind of open to, to pedestrians. And then another question from, from Mr. Packard was that he, uh, he saw a lot of uh, pedestrians and pathways in the renderings. Uh, is this campus primarily a pedestrian area and how is pedestrian access provided uh, and um, supported? And I had just uh, mentioned again that uh, we had moved parking to the perimeter to kind of open up the central, central campus. The campus itself is actually relatively small. Everything is within a 10 minute walk. So the, the, the idea was, or the intent was that uh, users would park once um, and then uh, access the campus through, you know, wide pedestrian uh, pathways on the interior, so. Great. So we did get a question on Thayer Hall. James Worshing asks, 
Will Thayer Hall happen while still occupied? If not, where do the occupants relocate to? You might want to turn on your mic, Matt. There we go. I think we got that. So uh, in response to James's question, West Point is going through an academic building upgrade program, which they're updating all of the buildings, all of the academic buildings on campus. There is a major portion of this. Parallel to this is a huge musical chairs uh, operation going on to move people, relocate departments and assets so all these buildings can, can be renovated. Originally, we were looking to do a phased um, construction to this, but uh, through collaboration with West Point, they were able to achieve unloading of this building entirely. They are building a temporary structure called the patent structure as a part of this academic upgrade program and a new building called the SEAC. So that allows individuals to be uh, phased through, fully remove everybody from there and do this, uh, unoccupy the building and do this in one construction period. That sounds wonderful. And another question for Monterey, it talks about a tree plan. Is there a tree plan for the site? Uh, not to my knowledge, but what was included in the uh, IDP or installation development plan were landscape standards um, for the installation. We worked with um, the uh, environmental uh, program director um, to develop uh, these standards that included a list of um, approved trees, uh, shrubs, and then ground cover. Great. Um, we got asked for Thayer Hall. It's a registered landmark. Can you discuss how the project team worked with the SHPO office? So the, the project team interacted with West Point's cultural resources. Um, we have a consultant, BCA, who is our liaison in working together with the design team with West Point's cultural resources and SHPO. Um, as this project is designed up to its conceptual level, there's still a lot more uh, coordination with SHPO and other agencies. There's also the H historic Hudson River Valley Association that deals with the view shed along the Hudson. So there's a lot of a lot of cultural resources and historic pieces that have been started that will continue to uh, evolve as this project moves to uh, to fruition. And then uh, Dave Packard wants to know. I assume this could be for any of the locations if there was retiree housing. Um, and we could certainly tell him outside of uh, the Naval Post Graduate School, there's some homes that would he could certainly purchase. I'm sure there's ones near uh, West Point <laughs> and ones near Lackland as well. <laughs> um, Luke asks, are some pedestrian pathways dual use for emergency vehicles? They are. We had intended that some of the sidewalks be uh, around 20 feet wide to accommodate uh, emergency vehicles. There would then, of course, uh, be emergency bollards, right, to keep um, any cars or trucks from entering the wide, wide sidewalks. But um, certainly on the interior of the campus, that was important for fire access. So, yes. Anybody else want to address that? Okay. Well, um, as people are thinking of more questions, I just wanted to um, point out that the design awards will be open for applications uh, probably around the first part of the year. Announcements will go out in November and December of 2021. Uh, packages are due in January, February time period. Uh, any structure that has been built for a federal agency can submit. So you don't have to be a, have a DOD facility. It could be one done for GSA or one done for any other federal agency. Um, uh, we might even open up to government, who knows. But right now it's federal agencies. It can be built projects or unbuilt in the last five years. And your package should include a write-up as well as a lot of visual images. Uh, I think we limit it to 10, 12 pages and any sort of, um, your, the form is up to you. You can see more details at the website that is linked there, http dot, you know, the backslash 
two backslashes www.same.org slash design awards and i will put that in the chat box as well um, there is no fee this is one of the few design awards programs that has no fee and we did that particularly to encourage people to submit anybody else any closing words jj you are the co-chair for design awards with me um, what would you like to let everyone know? Well, Dave, um, um, I'm going to defer to Dave to, to talk about his experience on the first one. What I want to say is um, um, when we started this journey, uh, Paula, five, five years ago as an initiative of uh, Urbine Meadow Initiative, um we realized that there are a lot of design awards programs out there but that's really we have not seen something focus on dod per se or the government i know gsa has one um in such a way the dod is one of the largest i think is the largest ae buyers in the industry and we don't have one focus on that um, so I just want to thank you, everybody who responded to the Design Award program, our, our uh, first Design Award program back in 2019. And uh, I'm going to like Dave to talk about experience. I think we never had an opportunity to to really brief everybody and, and present present uh, the certificate uh, due to COVID. And I don't know whether we're going to do that. Uh, this year or next year but we can talk about that later dave why not you talk about your experience as the uh, um, as the coordinator for the design award program we'll have to see if dave can rob can we get access to dave so he can speak and um, for everyone's information jj and i are co-chairs we did not organize the first jury the first jury was organized by david packard he helped um I'll align, get the jurors called and and organized everything. Dave, are you able to speak? Uh, if not, I would just uh, speak on his behalf that there are 30, if I remember correctly, there are 30 submittals. And I'm from, I don't, I think it's from 10 different companies um it was a you know it's very high quality submittals we ended up with three grand prize which you just uh you just saw the presentation today and then i think it was five uh merit awards um which uh, we have not i mean you see the brochure you're going to see all the projects over there but we have not have opportunity to present for the five merit uh, award winners to present them projects and uh, that's something we're looking into in the future to see how we're going to get the uh, merit project winners to present them, them project um the jury uh mix of um the industry i, I would say uh the 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 leaders in the in our industry uh, folks involved in the SME and also the professors from the educational institution. So it's a uh, it's uh, a mix of 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 jury and uh, they did a terrific job to be able to pick the winners. And I want to thank you SME to allow us to have this program. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next. Uh, both Paula and I were looking forward and uh, um, uh, with the entire APC community and looking forward to the next, uh, the second design of War Submittals. So I would also add that if you would like a copy of the brochure, just go ahead and let us know, put some um, names in there. We would be more than happy to send you a copy of the brochure itself. It's also out on the SAME um, site. And we also wanted to reach out to the um, people who served as jurors. So the chair was David Thomas, um, then Carl Stumpf, Harley Hightower, 
FAIA, all of three of those, Ta Dave Thomas, Carl Stump, and Harley Hightower, FAIA, and also Dr. Jim Peacock from the Air Force Academy. So a big thank you, a thanks to the jurors, and best of luck to everyone in our FY22 program. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you.